All right, everyone. I know as attendees are logging on, um, we want to just go ahead and welcome you to our GSM Live, More Than an Athlete, The Making of a Global Human. And before I turn it over to our host, we would like to open the show by asking you all to tell us, where are you tuning in from? And what is your connection to sport? Are you a coach, a former player, active player? Are you a fan, an academic, or working in the industry? You can drop your answers in the chat. And during our discussion, we are gathering your questions for Q&A at the end. So you can drop your question either in the chat box or use the Q&A button in the menu at the bottom of the Zoom. We will be calling these again for Q&A at, at the end of the show. And now I would like to turn it over to our host, Dr. Scott Brooks, Associate Professor of Sociology and Director of the Global Sport Institute. Thank you, Kendall. Thank you, everybody, for joining us today. Uh, we've got a really, really exciting program, and so we want to go ahead and get started. I'm going to set the stage, uh, and I'll do that by first telling the story, and then I'll introduce our segments um, and the speakers as they uh, will come to you. So I want to tell a story about September 22nd, uh, 2016. Uh, Havana McIlvain, who is a defense, was a defensive uh, player at the University of Washington. She was in the midst of working on her thesis, and this is her senior thesis, and it was about the impact of video recorded police violence on black male college students. And she's in the midst of doing all these interviews and focus groups, and she heads off to practice, and understandably was a very difficult practice. She found herself really overwhelmed with emotion and tears. And while she's leading, she was co-captain of the team then. She's leading this. It really just was a struggle. Um, she didn't feel uh, as though she had anyone to speak to about it in the moment. Um, so she just kind of made her way through that practice. The very next day, and this is the season opener for her team, she drops to her knees. Um, and when she does that, she felt an immediate rush and it was it was something that she said really made her feel comforted and she got the idea from her coach her coach said before the national anthem she told her if you want to kneel you can and for havana she said she didn't even know in that moment you know with everything that had happened and doing her thesis that there was something that she needed, that her coach could even give it to her, but dropping to her knee felt right. Since then, Havana went on. She was awarded a Bonderman Travel Fellowship based upon her, her senior thesis. That was eight months of traveling around the world. She did it really trying to trace her own African roots. And so she went to South America, to, to the continent of Africa, to Europe. She went to these places. She then was awarded a Marshall Scholarship where she studied inequalities and social science at LSE, the London School of Economics, and also got another master's at Oxford. And so I do that as an opening to talk about this, the topic that we have today. Today, we're here to talk about becoming a global human and really focus on this athlete journey and so that's going to be our first panel. Then we're going to move into talking about what sport is or isn't, reconciling the both, the business, the policy, and the impact of sport. And then we're going to wind it up of going through another journey around be becoming active. And this is going to be the evolution of the activism of Natasha Cloud. And so we're going to move into our first segment, Becoming a Global Human. And here, we're gonna have a conversation with Bacardi Jackson, who is Deputy Legal Director of the Southern Poverty Law Center's Children's Rights Practice Group, and Chris Draft, a former NFL player and lung cancer research advocate with the Chris Draft Foundation. And so, you know, here we're gonna get the first glimpse of how to talk about this becoming a global human. So I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to Bacardi. Thank you so much, Scott. And we're going to start off this segment with a poll and bring in our audience. 
Um, so we'd like for you all just to take a moment and answer these quick questions. Um, should there be an expectation for co collegiate and professional athletes to use their platforms to weigh in on social justice or political issues? Should collegiate and professional athletes just be quiet and play ball? Are athletes generally prepared to speak out? And if they do choose to speak out, should their leagues help prepare and protect them from the public fallout? So we would love, love, love if you all would just join in and you should have a poll on your screen and we're gonna just give you a minute to answer. We've got a few answers coming in. So we wanna see what you think about these questions. If you're just joining us, we're asking you to start off by weighing in on this poll. These four questions. We'll give it just another minute and see how it pans out. First question is kind of interesting, neck and neck to yeses and noes. It's complicated, isn't it? All right, want to weigh in? We'll give you 20 more seconds to do so. All right, well, when we just take a look at these results, and, and Chris, we're going to talk about this some, um, but it looks like we're almost half and half on whether or not there should be an expectation for athletes mm -hmm. to use their platforms, which is interesting. 55% say yes and 45% say no. Everyone seems to be in full agreement that they shouldn't just be quiet and play ball. And on the third question, are collegiate and professional athletes prepared to speak out? We seem to have a large percentage of folks, about 80% saying no, they are not prepared. Mm -hmm. And it looks like there's close to consensus um, where most people believe that to the extent they do choose to speak out, there's some obligation by the league to prepare them for that and to protect them from what the fallout may be. So those are some interesting responses. And um, I think we can, we can dig into that a little bit later. So um, thank you for, for those results. And let's just talk a little bit now. You can take those down. See. All right. So, Chris, in a lot of ways, you are this consummate global human that we are invoking in this conversation. You have been able to be fully present as an academician and scholar, as an athlete, as a philanthropist, as an advocate, as a husband, devoted son and uncle. You're at the airport right now to get to your <laughs> nephew's last yes. game. Um and, and on the whole, you have crafted for yourself a pretty purposeful and full life. Um, so can you just share a little bit about your own journey? Because everyone may not know it. Um, this journey to being a global human and the choices that you've made that may separate you from some of the players who might have given everything on the field of court and then just faded out of sight when their final minutes ran out. Awesome. Well, well, th thank you for inviting me to be on the, on the call, and I, I I love the uh, the questions to start this conversation. I think those are those are powerful to kind of set things. Uh, so what, what I'll do is not start at where I where I where I grew up. You go back, but really just start with first just acknowledging that when we're talking about being a global citizen. That if I have aspirations of playing in an NFL, and I have aspirations of playing in an NFL at a young age. At five years old, I said I wanted to play in the NFL, and it really wasn't much more than the Tony Dorsett, who played for the Dallas Cowboys, looked just like my dad. And that it made it where football was my favorite sport. Even <laughs> I kind of played it, I kind of did it, but it was, it was my sport, and it was my dad. He looked like him. I was going to play it. And so I, I say that as a beginning point because, you know, now even more so, it's, it's obvious that if I say I want to play at the highest levels of the NFL, that means that I have the, the ability to be a spokesperson to talk at a global level. So now in the work that I, that I do, that uh, the NFL brand, it's not soccer in the world, all right? We'll say that. It's the number one brand here in, in America, but, but it's so respected 
that basically can go anywhere with it. Um, so I would say that I started off wanting, you know, wanting to play. Uh, I knew that to be able to play the game, I had to be committed academically, be great on the field. That that brought me to Stanford to be able to do both. Uh, I I understood very obviously that this game was violent and that it can be over at any time, and that you know that my folks, without being so direct with it, it consistently reminded me that I needed to be more than just a football player, more than just a football player, and so that to go to Stanford to to pursue this this challenge of academics and athletics was natural. It it wasn't something that was a more of a as much of a choice that I would have done that wherever. But Stanford was very much in alignment with those those thoughts of being not just a ball player, but being more being a man. Now, leading up to this conversation, you and I had some interesting conversations, and and with the whole team here, we had some interesting conversations. And I'd love for you to talk a little bit about um, when you think about what it means to be a global human and more than an athlete, and you look back at some of the powerful historical figures that people may miss um, some of the importance of those figures. Um, And you've given some good examples. Would you just share a little bit of that with the audience about what that has meant when you look back in history? Yeah, I actually get a little 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 chills as I as you say that. Like it was it was difficult for me to not go to UCLA and, and choose Stanford. And for so many people, they have no clue of why that would be so difficult. Uh, well, Jackie Robinson went to UCLA, and when I when I think of, of Jackie Robinson, you think of not just being the first in Major League Baseball, but being the first intentionally as a guy that had shown throughout his life that he was going to stand up that he was going to be her. I mean, we, we know so much about Rosa Parks. I was looking at a post by the King Center of, of Rosa Parks and that's reminding people that she was 42 years old, that she wasn't old, she wasn't tired, that she was intentional about sitting. Uh, but I can say that Jackie Robinson was, was young and in very intentional in 1944 when he decided he wasn't going to get to the back of the bus at Fort Hood and, and end up getting court-martialed. I mean, they it, it end up getting wiped off, but he had to go through a court-martial. So Rosa Parks, 1955, Jackie Robinson, 1944. And so that's the guy that is going to, to Major League Baseball. That's a fighter. That's a guy that is going to stand. That's a guy that has a platform and he's going to use it. He's not going to just be the first baseball player. He's going to be a guy that when you give him this platform, he has something to say. He has proven that he has something to say. Uh, Another guy. I was in Louisville uh, a couple of couple, you know, couple of weeks ago, and and I was doing a lung cancer conversation. And lung cancer unfortunately affects our veteran community at a higher rate. And when we look at some of the screening criterion that really is in alignment with this fifty to seventy four years old, and you think of our veterans community, and a lot of those vets are a Vietnam age community. And since I was in Louisville, I was challenging people to think of Muhammad Ali. And Muhammad Ali's decision to not go and get drafted is huge. We talk about it, it's big, but do we think about how influential he was? And so how many black men did not go and sign up because he said no? So how many lives did he save? How many, how many families did he, did he save? And I, I think in terms of myself that my, my dad went to, went to college but if the champ went to Vietnam, would he have gone to Vietnam? And would I even be on this call? Would I even be here if he didn't go to college and meet my mom? So sometimes social justice is just about as much as uh, what an athlete chooses not to do is what they choose to do, just the model of that courage and the reverberations of that. I love that example. I think it is so powerful. Um, and it's interesting, we were just having this, you and I were having this conversation, but mm-hmm. looking at how our audience has weighed in on it, um, you know, there's some folks who have an assumption and, and you know, I'm, I'm a social justice warrior in my day job and I want as many people using their platforms for good as I can convince. But, you know, there's a debate here, like, should there be this expectation that athletes use this platform? Should we hold this standard out? And and if we did, you know, is everybody the right speaker for everything? 
Yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? It's, it's, it's so important that we don't equate the skill on the field with the skills off the field, right? Too often because somebody's this great player that we expect them to be now this great voice for the people. And, and, and just like a player plays a specific position because that's where their skill set is, they might not be the person to speak in a certain area. So we have to meet them where they are, but also we have to train them. And, and the training, I think, really comes back to what do we want from our young people that are playing sports? Is the idea of them being a citizen, of being a, a, a person that is, that is involved in the community that knows what's going on, is that something that's extra? Something that is, man, that would be nice. But really what I want you to do is just be so committed to baseball, football, whatever your sport is, that you are so immersed in that that you really don't even know what's going on. And so the question is, is are we going to create space for people to be more than, than their sport? Do we create space for conversation so that they can grow in, in their understanding of the issues? Because if they are only playing, playing their sport, if they are only practicing like crazy or in college going to classes, if they're not actually experiencing the world and getting to know it, uh, they really probably aren't the ones that need to be weighing in on a particular subject. Yeah, and, and sometimes there can be some harm to that, right? I mean, sometimes people can unwittingly play into systems or play into narratives um, or miss the political ramifications of actions that might sway an election. Um, and um, I'm just curious if you want to say anything more about what some of the harms are if we don't train up our athletes to be spokespeople and we're throwing a mic in front of them? Yeah, I think uh, when I when I look at Colin Kaepernick, I can give a, a couple of different examples in terms of him. But one of the things that that I, I, I ask people this question that, that unfortunately so many people, it seems like a crazy question. But if you were just talking to an athlete, it would be an easy one. And I asked the question, did he look like he wanted to play when he left San Francisco? Did he look like he wanted to play? Right. And, and because people are so caught up in the kneeling and the social justice and everything and, and not realizing that he can do both, that it doesn't have to be this either or, but rather what's best for him? Did he look like he, he wanted to play? And I think you know, when you look at it that way, it's an obvious answer that he didn't look like he wanted to play. Right. And so I, I asked these other questions. I said, well, if he didn't play, could he make as much or more money not playing? And it's, yes, he can. Could he be more influential not playing? Yes. Does he have to worry about getting hit by a grown man? You know, I say a grown ass man. Does he have to worry about getting hit? No. So how much more effective could he be if he was just committed to the cause? And so do we care about the, the individual and do we care about the cause in those instances? And so I, I think it, it's, it's important that we realize that the training is critical so that we understand, you know, that we can go through just like we do in, in, in sports. I will say, you know, football is so much about a game plan of going back and forth. Does this work? Does that work? And, and really, what's the outcome? So do we leave space for role playing? so that we can talk about really what's the impact, not just of you just standing up and saying something, but what's that going to do? How are other people going to perceive that? Really, really good, powerful points. Um, I, I wanna jump back a little bit to your own journey and ask if you would share, what are you proud about impacting? Like you, you have a platform still, you're not playing mm -hmm. right now, but how, how did you create that? And, and what, what are you most proud of when you look back at your legacy? So if I, I'll, I'll point out uh, really probably one, one issue as, as it relates. When I was in St. Louis, I was able to show our community, I played with the Rams, of how that we could be responsive um, by being aware of what's going on in the community. So knowing our, our local news and, and then recognizing what our platforms are from our community, our marketing and our PR, that we can respond. 
that Luke responded. I, 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 I don't want to go too far into it, but though the, the, we addressed a couple of issues. One of them that, you know, the, the water, you know, that there was, it was 105 degrees and we were able to respond by making people aware of making sure they're drinking, taking care of their people. My second year in the league in Chicago it was about 90 people that died during the summer because of the heat. So we were able to use our platform as a way of challenging people to take care of their, their, their neighbors. Uh, another instance is a, a, a couple of weeks later, an officer got shot by a, a 15 year old, which was absolutely horrible. But instead of our using our platform to just grieve and, and really kind of add to the fact that people were looking at North St. Louis as a whole, you know, this terrible place where bad things happen. We were able to galvanize a community through a, a, a trash, a community cleanup and really bring the community together and remind them that the changes that are going to happen are not, you know, don't look for us, the Superman, the one person to come in, that this is going to be a community effort and it can be as small as picking up trash that changes the community. Right. And so I, I, those, those you know, from the water, from the trash, and then all the people that, that, that actually picked up trash actually ended up going to the, going to the game, uh, to what, our second game of the season, which then sold out the game. So it was this very intentional caring about the community, but then also being able to, to grow the game. Uh, so the videos from that actually were, were shown to all the rookies that came in to the NFL. And that was basically 2007. So all the rookies had a chance to see that. So from the beginning, we started a conversation with them. What kind of things do you want? And then not just what you want individually, but knowing that there are people in community and marketing and, and, and PR that are there to support you in getting those things done. Well, well let's just build on that in our final couple of minutes here. Can, what advice would you give to a young up and coming athlete if they want to have a legacy that's beyond the game, how do they prepare themselves and, and what would you recommend they start doing right now? I would say the, the biggest thing is impact is about authenticity. So don't feel like you have to go find a cause. You know, you know, take some time to get to know yourself, understand what you care about. Uh, and then get to know your resources. Don't feel like you have to do it on your own. I mean, if you're in big time college ball, big time pro ball, there are tons of people around you that their job is to really to promote you. So before you feel like you have to do it on your own, make sure you're, again, you're very aware of the people that are there. And then also take the time to, to learn about it. You know? So don't feel, don't feel like that you have to run out and again, because you have this big platform that you have to then Oh, I got to go save the world tomorrow. No, <laughs> you're, you're not. You're not going to do that. It's going to take a lot of people to get that done. So don't feel rushed. Take your time so that then you can be confident. And then the other part is we practice before we go out on the field. <laughs> so if uh, if you need to or, you know, definitely you need to is practice. So what are you going to say? You know, I, you know, how are you going to respond to questions? Take some time and and use what we do in sport as a way of laying out your game plan uh, for success. So the same game plan you use for success on the field, you know, basically modify that for success off the field. Oh, I just love that advice. And, and, and even alluding to what you said earlier, know your real sports history, know the impact and the legacy that has walked before you. Um, but well, thank you so much, Chris. I know you are in the middle of travel and um, we just appreciate you taking the time to care about and, and talk about these really important issues and to be a mentor to others. So again, we appreciate you for making it happen. Thank you. Well, I, again, I'm so excited that we're having this conversation. I, I think that when we look at sports, the real key is that we have to see it as a training ground for men and women. And when we do that, then they'll naturally will be thinking about all these amazing things that they can do. And we'll be excited about it and not just say, Oh, it's so bad that you didn't play in the pros or you didn't play at this level, but oh my goodness, it's so amazing how you use these stepping stones to be able to do the work that you're doing. Amen. Thank you, Chris. And we'll kick it back over to you, Scott. Yeah, thank you, thank you so much. Safe travels to you there, Chris. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Bacardi. And we'll have Bacardi back on as we get to the end. We'll probably lose Chris, but thanks again. And our next segment, I'm going to go ahead and introduce 
our our next two uh, on the panel, and it's going to be Tracy Jones, who is executive director of PON, the PON Lab, and then also an adjunct lecturer with Wagner University, and then Charles Brown Jr., a Delaware State University football team captain and a dual major in kinesiology and liberal studies. We'll pass it over to you, Tracy. Great having you guys. Thank you again for allowing us to convene in this platform. Charles, thank you for taking time out of a, a busy prep week as you have one of the uh, biggest battles of your schedule uh, with HU coming to campus. Uh, so, you know, you got to protect the yard. Uh, so I thank you for uh, taking time on this Thursday night to really just engage in this conversation. And I think Chris and Bacardi set us up well for the next section as we talk about sport is and sport isn't, right? Reconciling the both and within the business and politics of sport. And what led us on this topic is something that has led me down this rabbit hole for the past seven years since living, leaving public accounting. 1968 might have been a flashpoint for a lot of athlete activism within the states. But it was in 2000 when Nelson Mandela stated, sport has the power to, that galvanized a whole other aspect of corporate that we have not seen in any previous time before 2000s. Sport as a catalyst to create change in communities, to create change in an apartheid South Africa that was unable to enact change in other ways, but the sport brought together a community. And what happens when we talk about that sport is, similar to how we misrepresent or misremember the MI, Martin Luther King, I have a dream speech. What we forget about in that power of sport quote is the root was talking about racism and justice and other systematic oppressions that we're facing, not just South Africa, but the world and how sports was used as that tool to bring us together. And so for the past seven years, what we've been looking at as an organization is, what is the harm in our good? Sport is an ultimate tool to think about how we can train up young scholars, how we can bring communities together, but what are we bringing our communities together for? Are we actually willing to talk about the issues that were present in 68 that are still present in 2023? Are we willing to talk about the issues that still most of our athletes, Black athletes, are considered commodities in an industry that's dominated by white professionals? And so for us, our question and what we work with student athletes across the athletic ecosystem is, how do we reimagine impact, the impact of sport that is, and how might we view the impact of the games we love if we truly understood the nature, extent, and timing of the business and political operations that they're rooted in? We love a game on a Sunday. I'm here in Philly, and we just had a World Series craze. But after the fandom is gone, are we really still a community? Are we really still upholding the values that we say we are through sport? And so in the next 10 minutes, I'm going to talk to a student athlete to see how Charles sees sport, how Charles is reconciling with the sport and the game that he's loved. And now that he's become more aware of the business and political aspects, how he's navigating this terrain. Because again, sport has the power to change, but do we have the power to reconcile the business and the political aspects that are deeply embedded within the games we love? So with that, Charles, my first question, and we've been working together for the past couple of years, Charles comes to us as a captain of the Delaware State University football team. He is a MIAC, the MIAC conference rep for the Student Athlete Advisory Council on a national level. He's a student leader, and most importantly, he's a global human. And so with that, Charles, if there was an equal emphasis 
You're from the DMV. DMV is, is, is really dominating sports right now. But if there was an equal emphasis on business and political education early in your athletic career, do you think you would approach sport the same or would you not be in sport altogether? Uh, I don't think I would approach sport differently. I think it would accelerate uh, what I'm doing now um, and not really knowing so much about SAC coming in as a freshman. I think that would be more so a focal point of getting the student athletes' voices out there um, and getting us heard from a student body as well. And I think that would be the focal point more so than just my sport. Now, how much of the, you know, just getting your voice heard, how much space was provided to you as an athlete coming through the ranks to talk with your coaches about, hey, I'm paying all these fees to compete in, the, in these tournaments. Where are those fees going? Right? Who's making these rules that say I can no longer hit like I want to? And what's the impact of some of the health factors that are going on within the game? Until I got into the national sack, I didn't really know anything about it. Uh, it wasn't really expressed upon us as student athletes. And once you get to the national sack, they pretty much talk about it more. You meet with the NCAA president. I mean, they hit on things such as that and legislation. And I think that's something that as a student body and as student athletes that we all need to focus on more um, and, and focus on more as a, as a group and learn more about. And so Delaware State, you know, it's positioned very well within the, you know, the MEAC conference. And, you know, the athletic department has truly, you know, championed just your student athlete development as well as some of your peers on campus and getting involved in other activities because of your position in, in the state of Delaware, right? It's the smallest state, um, but has, you know, quite an impact when you think about on the political landscape from the White House all the way down to the local level. How are you just kind of taking a step back over these last couple of years at Delaware State to say, if I knew about this sooner, I would probably advocate about my concerns to the NCAA in this way? Uh, I think more so because once I heard about it, a lot of people around the country have the same exact concerns. Um, it's not just HBCUs or just the MEAC conference. So I think it would be a focal point, especially me being a transfer student from a different conference. Um, this is These are global issues, um, and these are issues at our respective schools as well. So I think that would make me focus on it more so everybody's voice can be heard and it can be spread out amongst the student athletes. And, and just touch on that global, because, you know, when you think about the student population, you know, the athletic teams are very diverse uh, and represent multiple countries, as well as the school of business is probably heavily, um, you know, like in, in regards to the diversity of the, and the countries that are represented within the school of business and throughout campus. How is Delaware State and your collegiate experience compared to where you previously you know, uh, attended, how does that help you understand more of the, the global aspects of sport? Uh, I think us being more involved, um, I think it's more so um, of a student body, they involve you more and the student athletes, um, we have a very good connection with the higher ups all the way down to the bottom and our voices are actually heard. And I think a lot of the issues that we deal with here and everybody knows that we deal with here are actually global issues that are dealt with everywhere in third world countries and things of that nature. And what are some of the, the, the programming that the SAC has been able to do or, or is it just on the horizon to, you know, become more aware of the issues and, and be better champions? I think the biggest thing is conversation. Um, so that's the biggest thing that we've been trying to work on is getting everybody involved. I mean, not just student athletes, because Delaware State University is a very diverse campus um, and people come from everywhere. So just getting the voices heard from everywhere. So it starts with conversation um, and just getting everybody's voices heard. Now, NIL is a big topic in collegiate sport, right? And so now that you're, now that you're aware of some of the, the business aspects of sport, how have you approached the NIL scene and how has that impacted your ability to do other things on campus? The NIL scene is still very confusing. 
for a lot of uh, college athletes. Um, and I know it's seen in power five schools and things of that nature where there's people who have uh, a lot of money in NIL deals. But um, it was a conversation that we had for Division One SAC where um, we just wanted clarity um, on NIL deals and the policies. So if there is um, clear rules for everybody because there are state laws that still impact NIL. So it still is a lot of gray area in that field. So that's the biggest thing that we ask for from the NCAA is to have uh, kind of a clean clean slate on what NIL deals are and what they actually like, uh, what the rules are around those. Right. And I guess, you know, we've, we've been working through this for the past couple of years, um, but more recently, you know, you've had the opportunity to meet with congressional members regarding NIL legislation, right? And the NCAA is also working at the national level uh, with the SAC to ensure that student athletes' voices are being heard. There's a very concentrated, I think we've had 10 congressional hearings up until this point regarding NIL. Although you've had a conversation with members of Congress about NIL, what would it mean for the NCAA to have that same focus on legislative change for issues that are impacting your community? I think it would be huge because um, NIL deal is something that is just the world knows about, um, but not really the stuff that really matters and that impacts us the most. Um, NIL deal is just something that is the money grab for certain student athletes when there are actual problems that are going on that need to be voiced and need to be heard. Um, and I felt like if our voices were heard on the problems that were going on that impacts us mostly as not only student athletes, but human beings, um, I felt like it would be a lot of changes that were made everywhere. Who would be one of those uh, problems that, you know, they could assist in the advocacy for? Uh, I will say the biggest one, I would, just being able to hear your voice, I think a lot of it is kind of, nobody's able to speak up on on pretty much a lot of things that are impacting us. So I don't think the people's voices are heard at all. Um, so I think it's just being able to voice yourself and having a uh, platform to do so. I don't think there's really a platform in a sense to talk about many things. Yeah, and you know, that's one of the biggest things, right? Like when you think about the, the congressional hearings over the, the past two years to enact new NIL legislation, it's really been to ensure that the money is protected at the institutional level. And there's very little for the athletes uh, to be able to, to attract. And when we think about the NCAA, the NCAA is a member institution. Uh, you know, those members vote on the policy, vote on the rules that govern the, the sport. And when you think about how that governing kind of trickles down into society, what people, I guess, haven't really been aware of, but were more recently uh, came aware of during the hearing last week is that the NCAA is the pipeline for the Olympics. They are the pipeline for Olympic athlete training because unlike other countries, the U.S. does not have a ministry of sport that solely funds Olympic participation. And so mask within the collegiate system is a system to ensure that our athletes are the best of the best and they're getting the top training at these institutions. However, these Olympic sports aren't bringing the money in that football and basketball are. And as a football player, knowing that you're funding other sports to enhance the collegiate experience for all what are some of the conversations that you and other Division One football players, now that you're more involved in SAC, are having about understanding and getting a little bit more equity from the business side of sports? Yeah, I think uh, the biggest thing is just knowing that, you know, we are the athletes to actually go out there and, and, and play in those games, um, trying to figure out how we can benefit more from what we are doing and putting our bodies on the line for, because um, we don't really even hear about the money that is being made from certain games and things of that nature. So um, we're really, 
like not we don't really know anything about these deals or anything like that to know where the money is actually going um so it's really we're really <laughs> it's no news there's no information for us at all so that would be more of a conversation that needs to be had um so that there can be discussions for student athletes in a way to split it up evenly or uh, fairly for those athletes um, who are putting their bodies on the line. Yeah, because most of the missions of the athletic institutions are about equity and inclusion and you know creating a meaningful experience for all, yet some of the policies restrict who benefits. And with that, SAC has been the leading organization to ensure the student voices are being heard. However, there has to be more done where we can get the SAC voices that are being heard to actually policies that are being implemented to ensure equity throughout the total experience. And so, Charles, you have a couple years of eligibility left, per se. How is this experience as a student athlete and working with other international students on your campus shaping you and preparing you to advocate for issues beyond your current circumstance? I would say more so just learning exactly what is going on with everybody because um, everybody has different experiences, not only here, um, but where they are coming from. So I would say having those conversations um, and as a SAG department here, um, at this school with it being so diverse, that is something that we have to do a better part of um, is actually having those conversations with those individuals. Yeah, conversation and education is, is necessary. And to further kind of, you know, as we talked earlier in the spring about just all the focus on NIL legislation, what does it mean for the NCAA as the Transformation Committee report is coming down the pipeline for next year? when they're requiring more schools to have mandated programs. What about the programs like the geopolitical program so student athletes can be better informed about the global issues that they're often asked to take a stance in, or in favor for or against, but they don't have the understanding. If, again, we have a significant percentage of the Olympic team that is being developed at our colleges and we know the Olympic stage is one of the greatest stages in the world to platform issues as evidence in the 68 Olympics and more recent Olympics, whether it be for social injustices, gender injustices, or overall liberation for oppressed people in the respective countries that the Olympics invite to participate in. Shouldn't the athletes be more informed on these issues? And shouldn't we think about how them not being informed, as Chris talked about, causes a greater harm? And Charles, you have an experience that is, and as we close in January, you get a chance to be at the national convention. You've had an opportunity these last couple of years to be engaged on campus, speaking with your beer, speaking with your peers, talking with your community members about some of the issues that are really affecting you, right? Not focused on NIL because the money's going to be there, but focused on other issues. What's the main priority for you and other athletes as you're going in to this important convention in January to make sure the NCAA understands where you're coming from? I think the biggest thing would be learning the actual things that are going on for the legislative processes, um, educating ourselves on those things so that we can have those important conversations and how they impact us as student athletes for, they make a lot of changes, um, but every school is in different circumstances. So certain changes impacts other schools more than the rest of them. And student athletes still have to suffer from it while the student athletes on campus don't have an idea about it. Uh, us as the SAC department, we have to be the voice for them and we have to spread this information along our SAC departments at our respective schools so that we can continue to voice and, and hear from other people um, so we can advocate for them at the national convention. Sport is, sport isn't. And as athletes are becoming more involved, we must ask ourselves, how are we looking at the impact 
And how are we preparing our athletes to do more than entertain on a Saturday, a Monday or Tuesday in the BCS championship game or March Madness? But how are we preparing them to really be advocates and champions of issues on the global stage and not just on their campus? Charles, thank you. Thank you again for taking time out of your prep and the whole team. We thank you again for this opportunity to be on the platform. Back over to you, Scott. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you, Charles. And hope that you guys will stick around and we can bring you back for one final uh, bit at the end after um, we finished our, our finish our third segment. So now I want to call for a poll. Here we go. Kendall's pulled up that poll while people are putting their answers in, right? I'm going to go ahead and introduce this third segment. The topic title is The Evolution of the Activism of Natasha Cloud. And so we've got Assistant Professor of Sports Marketing in the Hobbs School of Business at St. Joseph's University in Philadelphia, Stephanie Trice. And we have Natasha Cloud, the WNBA player with the Washington Mystics, has a championship um, under her belt as well. Uh, Natasha is an activist for civil rights and social justice, really had a big impact on uh, setting the stage for, for athletes to continue to think about, you know, are there different ways to be spending their time um, beyond the court? So I want to go ahead and bring in Professor Trice and bring in Natasha. Let's do this. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for the introduction, uh, Natasha Cloud. Sorry, you your name is wrong there. You're using my No, language. it's all good. I prefer to be Stephanie Trice anyway. You know what it is. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, welcome, welcome. I'm gonna get right into it. Um, I want to read a statement from some scholars, scholars Cooper, Macaulay, and Rodriguez. And I think you're gonna agree with it. Um, sport is a place where inequalities such as racism, sexism, economic stratification, and other forms of oppression are reproduced exacerbated and or ignored. Um, I believe that is true, but I also believe that sport is a positive place for social change, a positive platform for social change. And I think you would agree with that. Absolutely. I, I, I agree with the sentiments that sports has a way of uniting everyone, uh, regardless of what your background is, which sexual preference, color, race, ethnicity, all the above, et cetera. It has a way of uniting everyone and bringing people together for a common cause. And when you can bring people together for a common cause, you can have those hard dialogues that need to be had. And Pash, you're considered one of the most passionate advocates for social justice in the WNBA. I like to call you a freedom fighter. I uh, like that. <laughs> yeah. And so, a couple things. I want the audience to understand, A, what your personal brand is, and B, how your intersectional identities help inform the, the type of issues that you activate on. So give me three or four words that would describe your, your personal brand, and I want the audience to think about that as we move through this conversation. First and foremost, I'm dope. Like, <laughs> first and foremost, I feel like I'm a dope person, um, a dope soul, dope human being. I say that very humbly. Um, I feel like I'm very fiery. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm passionate. Um, and I'm going to add in the fourth because I really do lead with my heart and everything that I do. So um, I really do believe that love fixes a lot of things. And when you lead with love and light, um, your ability to reach people. Um, especially with how we're trying to reach people, it makes it a little bit easier. Okay. So you use as your platform, the court, right? Yes, ma'am. As, as well as your social media uh, platform. Tell us some of the issues that um, you feel moved to speak out on and to act on. Yeah, I feel like the intersectionality of what makes me me is what I'm very passionate and very outspoken um, about because obviously I go through these things every single day. So being black, being a woman, being gay, um, the the list goes on and on, right? I, I fight for gun violence. I fight for kids. Um, I, I fight for human lives. I'm in, in the process of doing this now um, with what we have going in our world and uh, trying to fight for innocent people that, you know, are just begging to be seen and be heard. So let's talk about... Um 
your racial identity development and how that impacts um, your activism and also your sexual orientation uh, development and mm. how those things um, progress as you moved into your womanhood and um, how that, the, the weight of that once you came out made a difference in your life. Yeah. Um, so for like a quick, quick background, um, mm -hmm. I am the youngest of five. Um, I am the only mixed race uh, child in my family. I have an all white family. I have two white parents. Uh, my real dad is Emil Cloud. I have his last name. He took me at birth. Um, he raised me as his own. He happens to be a white man. Um, my sperm donor did not want me. And, um, you know, my family took me in and raised me. And I was raised in a middle class white family. Being innocent, being a kid, you don't really understand um, until, you know, the harsh reality of the world really interjects itself into your life. And um, I can remember like the first time I remember being told that I was black was on the playground. It was like, you're a black girl. And I'm like, what? <laughs> like, I just thought it was a girl. Like, I didn't know we had to like distinguish what it was. And I remember going home and saying it to my mom and she was so upset because she just didn't want me to feel different and other than or to be treated differently, right? But she knew that harsh reality of what our world is would eventually come um, and kind of slap us in the face. So um, just diving into, you know, our family situation, which I wouldn't change any of it for the world because I really am where I am today because of my entire story, the good and the bad. And so, um, you know, finding out my mom had an affair and you know, my dad took me in, that created a different dynamic in the world that my brothers and my sisters saw, right? It wasn't the same world that I saw. Um, and so kind of trying to navigate in a really predominantly white area um, while still understanding as I went through the processes of life, right? You go through high school and I didn't really feel like I got my first black experience until I went to the University of Maryland my freshman year. And it was the most diverse um, that I've ever been uh, within my community and it was so like refreshing to me to finally get to know my black side and to find my blackness and I think within that I really started to identify myself because before that I was like you know I'm a gray area kid I'm not white enough I'm not black enough I'm just this gray area kid that I don't really know who I am yet and I need to go through life to figure that out in finding diversity I found I'm a, I'm a strong black woman and I find a lot of pride in that but I also take a lot of pride in being of mixed race but what I identify as is what you see, I am black. So that's what I identify as. And so um, finding power in that, finding power to be able to say that when you were raised in a mixed um, kind of privileged life and in the sense of you were raised, I understand the privilege that I had in being raised by a white family um, and understanding how that kind of navigated my advocacy is like, I understand. I understand what it means to have all the resources and opportunities that I needed because my parents were white. But I also understand that every kid that looks like me and doesn't look like me too, deserves the same ample amount of opportunities presented to them. Um, and so going into uh, my sexual preference, I got into the league and being surrounded by just really powerful women that embraced themselves. And one of the narratives that I hate that is said about our league is that it's just a gay league. That's not true. But when you have women that are just willing to be their authentic selves and not be scared to test boundaries and to push limits and to find out who they are, you're obviously really gonna find yourselves within, um, within that space and being empowered. So I feel like, when I finally came out about my sexuality and I first came out as bi because I'm still very attracted to men and that was its own thing because I think bisexual people get over-sexualized because it's like, oh, you like both. And it's like, hmm, well. But anyway, with that being said, that was really hard in itself. But I feel like when I finally did that, it was like, I was able to take just so much weight off of my shoulders to finally be like, I'm figuring out who I am after I struggled for so long as a kid to figure out who I was at my right. core, who, I, who am I, am I going to present to the outside world, you know? Yep. And, and having that weight off of you allowed mm -hmm. you to really, really be your authentic self. Yeah, uh, and just I want harness it and see what I wanted to do. Yeah. I want to take you to 2016, um, your second year in the league, mm -hmm. and um, your team wore Black Lives Matter shirts. 
Mm-hmm. Right. And you um, originally and, got fined for it too. Correct. Mm-hmm. Now, when it talk, tell us about what you were thinking as uh, the decision to to wear those shirts uh, was made by you and your teammates. Mm-hmm. Keeping in mind that this is only your second year in the league. For sure. Keep in mind that WNBA players are not played like uh, paid like NBA players. Mm-hmm. Keeping in mind that this could cost you endorsements, mm-hmm. right? And does. <laughs> and, and does. And, and does. So you're eight years in the league. You have two endorsements. Yeah. Right? You mm-hmm. are. Wait, before, before, let me, let me give some stats out here so we can understand. Talk about a mama choice. Yeah. You, um, 2019 world champions, mm-hmm. right? Um, you are the heart and soul of the team. You're the fan favorite. 2022 WNBA all defensive first team. 2022 WNBA assist uh, assist leader, franchise leader in assists. Um, and you have two endorsements. Mm-hmm. So Black Lives Matter in the locker room, the decision to wear that shirt did you did you weigh at all what it was going to cost you? Absolutely. I feel like when I got to the league, the WNBA is so special and so important because this was the blueprint from the moment that I walked in. We speak on social issues. We talk about the problems regardless of what the repercussions or the consequences are because we have the ability and the platform that God gave us to ignite change and to really shed light on issues that play communities that we are very much a part of. So it was very established from the beginning that this is just who we are. And I remember, I can't take credit, I will say the Minnesota Lynx were the first team to do it. And obviously Maya Moore, a legend in herself, but a legend in being an activist um, and advocate, she, she ignited that. And from there it was like, okay, how do we now harness this? And there was those hard conversations in our locker room. But at the end of the day, I think what the difference about our league is, is we are a league full of women. So we do have kids within our locker room. We had two young black boys in our, in our locker room. So whatever uncomfortability that was felt in our locker room, how do you look at him every single day and we don't fight for him? Because at some point that innocence is going to change and now the world is going to look at him as a threat and as less than, and we all know him, whether we're white, black, whatever, we know him. And so he shouldn't be judged. He should be judged off of his character, not by the color of his skin. Um, and et cetera. So for us, it was like, no, we're going to stand on this for, for, you know, not only our communities, but especially these two young black boys that are in our locker room and a part of our mystics family. And so, um, we got fined initially, but, uh, for me, I wasn't really outspoken at that point. I was letting the vets more so do the talking, but where I came into play was understanding, um, the kind of business aspect of it, right? We were um, sponsored by Adidas at the time. So we can't wear Adidas shirts. We can't wear, you know, logo shirts or whatever, but we can turn shirts inside out. We can, we all have a black set of warm up shirts. So yeah, the W wants to find us and say that we have to wear our warm ups. Okay, well, we're going to wear only black and we're going to turn them inside out. So all you see is a black shirt and you're going to know what we need. And so I think that um, kind of started to sweep over the league. And once it did, you can't find us. And then it's us against you. And as a league, you don't want to look badly that you're going against your players that of a league that's 80% made of Black women. So you're literally going against their lives. If you oppose, you find, you do anything. So um, just understanding the power that we had as players um, and understanding that while we might not all see and come from the same background, see the same way, um, at the end of the day, we're talking about human life, and that's a reason to fight for. Okay. We don't have, we're coming up on time, believe it I'm or not. I'm so sorry, Mama Trace. You know I'd be rambling. <laughs> no, you're fine. You're fine. Um, I remember uh, us going to see Angela Rye, mm-hmm. and I remember you standing up and asking her, this would, would be the next year, um, that you had this platform and you wanted to use it. And mm-hmm. I remember her telling you, you will find the thing that you're passionate about. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think you first found that in 2019 when you went to read to some students only to find that there were bullets embedded in the school. Mm -hmm. So you took to Instagram, called out the mayor and the city council person. Uh, So (laughs) that is is, is what you do. You use your platform that way. Because we're coming up on 
short on time. Um, and that same year you won the uh, WNBA's Dawn Staley Community Leadership Award. I want to fast forward um, to uh, 2020 during the time that uh, after George Floyd's murder. Mm -hmm. um, you penned an article in the Players Tribune called Your Silence is a Knee on My Neck. And I, I just want you to comment on it, on this a bit, a piece of it. Um, but you know what crushes me most of all? It's how the systems of power in this country are built so strong mm -hmm. and with such prejudice that in order for white supremacy to flourish, people don't even have to actively be about white supremacy. They mm -hmm. don't have to carry the burden of being openly racist or waste their energy or being loudly oppressive. It's not that at all. All they have to do is be silent. Mm -hmm. And I know one of the things that upsets you the most mm -hmm. is when people don't take a stand. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us about the stand you took when you decided to, after your championship year, to sit out and work on social justice? Yeah, that was by far the hardest decision that I've ever made in my life. And I say that with a free agency coming up for me um, to sit out the year after we won a championship. I'm having one of my best personal seasons. And then on top of it, I, I am the engine behind our team. I'm the point guard. I'm the quarterback. So we go as I go. So I'm doing a disservice by not going into this bubble. But also understanding that that moment in time, because I'm also going to say her name, Brianna Taylor, was just murdered as well. So. At that time, as black and brown people in America, whether we knew them or not, you feel that trauma, you live that trauma every single day. So whether it's in our homes or outside, the minute we walk out our doors, we're not safe anywhere anymore. And I think at that point with, with George, especially, it was the first time that I saw our white allies be like, oh shit, this is what they've been screaming about. And so to be able, we need our white allies in order to really make movement and to move the needle. And so in that moment, it was, I cannot let this moment pass and not take advantage of the momentum that is behind the Black Lives Matters movement. The movement, not the organization, the movement, people stay with me here. So um, just understanding that I really do believe that God intended this game to be more than just winning championships and bringing it back to DC. He intended me to be a servant to my community and to others and to be a voice for the voiceless. And so how can I best be a champion for my community in a time that we desperately need it? And that was sitting out and being in those in those rooms where legislation was being talked about, utilizing my platforms that I've made over my tenure in the WNBA, um, calling on my NBA uh, counterparts to really step up to the plate and and be about what they say they're about. And again, just learning from grassroots organizations that have dedicated their lives to this, but. I feel like as athletes, we can, you know, be put on a pedestal so much. But when you when we take those jerseys off, we face these same things every single day in our life. And we're not um, we're not protected just because of those jerseys. Um, and so um, I wanted to take myself off the pedestal and be on the front lines and really just be there and be a part of, you know, a movement and a change and a, and a fight for something different. And lastly, and most importantly, um, you have received social media hate. You have received death threats. I want to know how you take care of yourself. Um, yeah, it took me a long time. I'm not even going to lie. It took me a long time to figure out what worked for me um, because this is a really traumatic and vulnerable spaces that we continuously put ourselves into. And yes, the, the threats that I receive, all the social media hate, um, I think I do a pretty good job of just being very secure in myself. And again, I think that comes with, you know, I, I struggled early on, but I really worked to find myself and who I was at my core. So uh, something that's always kept me grounded is know your why. When you know your why and what you're doing it for, it's going to always keep you grounded through the adversity and through all, you know, the bullshit along the way. And, um, you know, for me, self-care, I have two pit bulls. Um, I treat them more like children than my dogs. Stephanie Trice knows I was protecting my baby yesterday on the phone with her. Um, but I like to just spend time with them, go out in the nature, really just kind of turn off and turn off from my phone, especially because we can get so caught up in social media and, you know, our lives and our money at this point are really driven through the phone. So just being able to disconnect, um, family is huge for me. Family is so important for me. So just surrounding myself with my people. Um, and then something I've also gotten into is sewing. 
because I like my fashion stuff. So I am okay. really learning how to like just do my own stuff and, and be creative and just, you know, allow myself space to be authentic and authentically me. Thank you, Tosh. I want you to hang tight. We're going to bring everybody back on. Uh, yeah. Scott, I'm going to turn Thank it back you for having me, Mama Trice. You're welcome. Yeah. Thank you for, for being with us. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's great. It's great seeing you and hearing you uh, again, Tosh. It's always, always a pleasure. To Thank you, Scott. Yeah, yeah. So I want to welcome back uh, Bacardi Jackson, Charles Brown. And let me see, is Tracy still around? He may... Yeah, Tracy's still out. Great. And I, I want to kind of, I mean, there's there's a number of threads that come through. Um, one of the ones that really, really, I think in some ways gets underappreciated and talked about is, is the role of identity in it, right? And so when we start with a Chris, Chris talked about the importance of, you know, having a Tony Dorsett, someone to look like, you know, his father and how that made a connection for him, you know, his ideas around the role of, of a Jackie Robinson. You get, you know, Charles is, is a football player, right? And in it, he's taken on a role of being a captain and a leader, and he's in sack and really trying to get involved and trying to represent for others, but that this is a part of, of his own personal development. And then, of course, with Tasha, you hear, you know, similarly, right, that this is, that this is a journey. And I think that that's something that really gets underestimated and then I think more importantly, when you don't think about it in that way, you don't get to what Tasha said. And I've heard from so many other folks who have been activists, and that is love. So I, that's where I really want to start. I want to start with this, with this question around love. What is, where is the love in the work that you're doing? I'll start with that. And then the second was would be, and so when you think about where this love is, you know, how does that help us to, to sustain this, this journey, right? Particularly as we look at the repealing of DEI as quickly as all these jobs showed up and all of the, you know, the interest by corporations, we've now seen a huge cliff fall off where now all these, these jobs are literally just gone, disappeared in most cases. So let's start off talking about love. Charles, I want to start with you. When you think of why you do this, you know, where is the love in this work? Um, what keeps you going? I would say the youth, uh, being able to advocate for my people. I think that's where the love is. Um, being somebody who, this is nothing that I've seen anybody do before. Um, so being that person for the people that come after me, you know, I feel like that's big. Um, so I can go home and, and help lead a new path for the kids at home and, and allow them and help them to strive on what they want to be and truly be. Yeah. All right, Bacardi, you're you're there. You work in the children's rights, like in that space. So it, in some ways, it may seem obvious that there's love because we often just think it's easy to love kids. But we know that that's not the case. When we look at our black and brown kids, when we look at marginalized folks, Where's the love for you um, and how does that sustain you? You know, the, that question of love, it came up in a conversation I was having earlier today because the work I do is driven by the fact that in our nation, we have not grappled with the fact that we have never loved Black children and thought that they were fundamentally um, worthy of the same kind of nurturing and education that other children are. In fact, we don't even see them as children. We adultify them. We sexualize them. We... Uh, criminalize them. And so um, to me, love is at the heart of this. We have got to move the needle and change the hearts and mind. And once we figure out how to love Black children, we will solve all of our problems. And so to me, the love lives right there. We have to change the narrative. We have to lift up and understand that we live in a culture that was built on devastating our communities. And when we take the time to love our children, when we take to the time to use our resources, our voices, to tell everybody that Black children are worthy of love, then we will we will solve everything. And you know, I'll, I'll date myself a little bit, but that this to me is where Stevie Wonder has always been really powerful, right? You think of different Stevie songs, 
where he's talking about what you get from the red man, what you get from the black man, talking about loving children. And there was always something there. I'm at the heart of it. Um, Tracy, for you, where where is the love? I think it's just in the potential of our humanity. Uh, I think with, and I spent a lot of time with youth coming up and, and just, you know, being able to work with our youth athletes, now our collegiate athletes, but tapping into the humanity of those that are overlooked because after you graduate high school, a lot of people forget about the adult. Uh, and there's a lot of child within that adult that has never been taught or touched. And for me now, having the experience professionally in my career, as well as uh, just in some of my civic leadership opportunities is seeing, okay, the system failed you, but is there a way that I can be that bridge to your next. I, I may not be able to deliver, but can I provide relief that is going to get you to restoration and then ultimately advance you as a human? I appreciate that. All right, Professor Trice. Um, the love for me is I, I only teach sport business classes, right? And so the love is that sport is the hook, right? To, to teach students about the history of some of what Bacardi is talking about. Why do things look the way they look today? And, and so we use sport as the lens through which to understand that history. Um, so I love that I get to do that uh, every day. Um, I love that I get to use my scholarship as activism. Um, so that's where the love is for me. And, and you know, loving the students that you teach. Um, you know, in, in ways in which you push them um, through uncomfortable conversation. And so, Tasha, when, I, I'm thinking of the different spaces you've been in, whether that's at Maryland, of course, at St. Joe's, and then with your different teams. You know, the, the W looks to us from the outside, looks to me from the outside, that there's a lot of love shared between the athletes. For sure. um, I, I have to imagine you alluded to it with Maya Moore. Tell, talk about the love of that, of the, your, your fellow athletes and how yeah. you come together. Yeah, I think more than anything, um, the W is the most progressive league, professional league we have here in the States. And I say that with the fact that all of us, again, come from different backgrounds, different stories. Um, we're all different colors, shapes, sizes all the above, but we always find the commonality, whether we agree or not, there's always a common ground that, okay, if you don't necessarily feel comfortable with being rah-rah and upfront about your activism, but okay, we can give you things to post on your social media that you can at least steer your fans, your the people that follow you into the right direction um, to be on the right side of history with stuff right now. I'll be honest, I've been tweeting about it. I'm a little disappointed with our league right now with where our world is. Um, that I am a, really one of the only ones that is speaking up. I think it's about three or four players that have been speaking up. And this is new for me. So uh, I'm going to continue to challenge. I'm going to continue to push um, because that's just what the right thing to do and my moral compass uh, will allow me to do. And something I did want to say before I got off of here is Stephanie Trice was the first Black professor that I've ever had, the black, first Black teacher I've ever had, um, and a Black woman to that extent. Um, I remember hearing all the horror stories about taking her in class because as an athlete, we thought we was taking, you know, she was married to the, the men's basketball coach. So we was like, she gonna help us out. No, she challenged me more than anyone. And when I think about like where I really started to understand my power, I think back to a lot of your classes, uh, Professor Trice, of how you do did you sport to make it much more simple for me and understanding how to create change through that sport to impact um, the communities that we all come from, right? And we use sport to get out of, but now that we're out, how do we give back to that those same communities that help build us and raise us? So thank you, Mom Trice. You're welcome. And I and it's a great place for us to end. I wish we had more time. It's been amazing having each of you all as as 
as folks to to hear from and to guide our conversation. You know, I, I want to wrap up going back to the story of Havana McElvain, right? So the sister, mixed race sister, out of a Colorado, goes to the University of Washington and has this moments, right? These moments of realizing her identity, these personal struggles and, and trials and trying to make sense of this world and coming out on the other side, you know, really just as, as Tasha's has talked about and Charles have talked about really as advocates, really trying to figure out how do we make this better world? And so I thank each of you as, as athletes who are here watching and just being a part of it. Of course, I thank uh, Natasha Cloud and I thank Charles Brown for being with us. And then I thank our, our facilitators, Bacardi Jackson, Tracy Jones, and of course, Professor Trice, you know, creating these spaces as we've heard here, it has an impact, right? And here is where we'll be able to, we're able to bring these intersections of whether it's a university as well as athletics or it's the legal, it's the policy. We've been able to, to tap into each of these, right? That it's, we are beyond just having conversations. We are looking for real change and we understand now whether you're a Charles and you're going, hey, I don't know where this money is, but I know there's something that's not right. But what we can do is mm -hmm. keep asking questions. We can keep mm -hmm. coming together. I can keep going to people and saying, what are your needs? And we're doing this at earlier and earlier ages. So the more that we can continue to pour in based upon love, right? The more that we're going to have success and we've got to do it together because nobody can run this race alone, right? Mm -hmm. This is a lifelong marathon. And I think that we have to continue to show love for each other because that's what also can, you know, allows others to do the same thing for someone else. And, you know, when I think back to Frederick Douglass and him talking in his autobiography about the moment when he saw in his white slave master's wife's eyes, she had been told that she could not teach him to read he saw the light dim in her eyes. What he saw was a loss of her humanness. Her global humanity was dimmed. It was decreased. And what we're seeing here in, in our world is this same thing going on. And that's what's creating a lot of this division and separation is that we're allowing ourselves to let to be less human. But we're, mm -hmm. everyone, for, for coming together today again with this topic, the global human, more than just an athlete. And as we know, we got to do this together. So thank you so much. Appreciate each of you all for, for contributing. Thank you. Thank you.